What is going on, Los Angeles? Welcome to the first ever Victory Bell Selection Show here on the LA Football Network, our city, our network. And we have a special production for you, a four-part mini-series that we are launching right here, culminating with a live production in-person show on November 19th at the Rose Bowl when our USC Trojans and our UCLA Bruins face off, big brother, little brother, whatever you want to call it, the freeway series, all come together for this huge game. And we are going to talk all about it in these four episodes, little mini-series. We're going to get into the history, get into the great matchups, get into obviously this year's game, the importance of it, not only for these programs, but for this city. And breaking it all down with me, we have a great panel from the LA Football Network. I'll just go around the horn. No particular order because all of you guys are so special. It means so much to this network. So I'll just start to my, what is that, right on the screen. Played for USC, Long Beach Poly product, Coach Rowe, Alfred Rowe. What's up, man? How we doing? Representing USC, welcome to the show. What's going on, man? I'm excited to do this. This is big. Like like we've been talking about, we're getting ready for our Super Bowl, right? It's it's kind of like a bowl game because you get uh, a month before the bowl game. So we've got four shows to get this ready and get really excited and make this happen. I'm happy the network is doing this. It's going to be big for LAFB. Oh, and fight on. You got to get that in. <laughs> got to get that in. It's got to uh, – let's shoot over to our UCLA side. He is our host of the Bruin Bible, our beat writer, our connoisseur, our extraordinaire for all things UCLA Bruins, Dirty Chai, Will Decker. What's up, brother? How we doing? Going on, guys. Uh, really, really pumped to be talking some UCLA-USC. This has a chance to be not only just the biggest rivalry on the West Coast, but a national rivalry game moving forward with some cool, interesting pieces coming out of this. So really pumped to do this four episodes. We're going to make it really fun. Yeah, since this is a you know crossover, I know you're just giving the peace sign, but you're going to have to be careful uh, doing that so much or everyone's going to think you're representing the, the fight on community. So going diagonal to him, representing our USC, does our beat writing, phenomenal writer, does his own show on YouTube. I won't say what NFL team he represents, but for all types of purposes here with these, the USC Trojans, Mr. Phil Robinson, what's up, my man? How we doing? What's going on? <clears throat> this is a fantastic opportunity. I'm happy to be here. Can't wait to get this thing rolling and uh, meet up at, for the first time at the Rose Bowl for the USC versus UCLA game. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this has been something I've been looking forward to for a while now. Exactly. Phil resides up north and we'll be meeting in person finally at this game. Can't wait to meet you, Phil, and have you meet the family and, and just hang out and have a good time. And last but not least, alma mater of both schools – and represents both schools so well, so respectfully. My co-host of the LA Football Show, a constant um, ally and co-host of the Bruin Bible, and does writing for both teams plus coverage, the madman, Jamal Badney. What's up, brother? How we doing? Great to be here, Ryan. I'm so excited about doing this show. You know, this rivalry holds such a special place in my heart. I've grown up with it. I've, I've sort of experienced it from both sides, and there's there's nothing quite like this rivalry of these two great schools sharing a city. So thrilled to be doing this with with you, Will, Phil, and Coach Rowe. Uh, couldn't have, pick four better guys to do this with. So thrilled to be part of the LAFB family. We tried to stretch the budget. Could not quite get Bruce Buffer on here to host and do the tail of <laughs> tape. So I, I did my best with my week less masculine voice, but we made it through. I'm your host of this, Ryan Dowd, playing neutral for both teams, as I do usually on the LA football show. Anyway, so gentlemen, thrilled, excited, really excited to get into this. Uh, this game, you know, we talked and have talked all year about how special this season has been already for both these teams. I remember talking with Will and Jamal just a year ago, like almost exactly watching the Ohio State-Michigan game and saying, man, I cannot wait. I knew it was coming. Cannot wait for the USC UCLA rivalry to get back to that level of not just pride, but of actual prowess and rankings and the culmination of the hype within the city. And I think we're going to get that this year. And obviously we have a, a few weeks until we get there, but sitting now where these teams sit, both only one loss teams, both ranked in the top 10, certainly a special, special year. So let's start this off though. We're going to look back. Some Ryan, I, I gotta Ryan. I have to correct you. They're both not in the top ten. Only one team is in the top ten. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. 
<laughs> yes, I guess. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna end the show with that. On the Bell Selection Show. <laughs> I was basing off the AP, the more credible rankings at this point. But yes, you are correct based on the CFB rankings released on Tuesday. But let's look back. A lot of history between these games, between these teams, between these schools in this great city of Los Angeles. Jamal and I have talked. I can't think of any other historic rivalry that is separated by only 15 miles. I mean, you look at some of these great institutions in this great country, the the Alabama Auburns or the Colorado, Colorado States, the Washington, Washington, all of them. They're separated not only by cities, some are separated by states. And this is one of the few that is less than 20 miles apart. So it's such a special rivalry. Houses divided all over and such a fun weekend that comes. And so we got to look back. So We'll kind of go around the horn, toss back memories, keep it light, keep it fun. We can throw some jabs in there. Jamal, I'll start with you since you went to both schools, have a, and just, I think, retain history, maybe better than anyone here. What are some of your favorite memories of this Victory Bell game? Yeah, Ryan, there's there's a handful that come to mind, a, a few that I was directly there for in terms of the games and a few that you get indoctrinated into being on either side of the rivalry. You know, everything sort of begins with that amazing 1967 game between OJ and Gary Beban, where the national championship, the Rose Bowl, the Heisman was all on the line. It was that famous run by OJ for 80 yards where he sort of cuts it across the field. He was almost surfing on the field and USC wins that game, wins the national championship and, and Gary Beban ultimately won the Heisman trophy that year. And then OJ came back and won the Heisman by the greatest margin of victory ever. That was a very special game. You think about the 88 game, between Rodney Pete and Troy Aikman, uh, number two versus number six. It was the measles game where Rodney Pete had measles going up against Troy Aikman. And the history of that was incredible because in the pros, Rodney Pete ended up backing up Troy Aikman with the Cowboys. And, you know, that game, UCLA lost to Washington State a couple of weeks earlier. Otherwise, it would have been a one versus two game. It was two versus six. Epic game. SC comes out on top. I remember the 91 game growing up where it was Todd Marinovich against Tommy Maddox in a game where both those guys combined for over a thousand yards passing and SC wins it at the horn 45, 42 uh, Marinovich hits uh, Curtis Conway on the left corner of the Rose bowl uh, for that win. And then I'll always remember 96, Ryan, that was the first time this game ever went into overtime. It was a double overtime game. UCLA was down 17 points with less than six minutes to go. And I remember my dad, was so angry that he shut off the TV and it was that night was his company party. And, and he was the CEO of the company and he walked in and he had a, he had a bet with his employees that if you know, UCLA won, they all had to wear UCLA sweatshirts. But if SC won, he had to wear an SC sweatshirt and he was so angry. He shut off the game, went, went and got an SC sweatshirt to walk into his company party only to realize that UCLA came back and won in double overtime and saw <laughs> Everyone at his company decked out in UCLA gear. And I remember that memory when I was 12 years old. And then the, the 06 game was very significant. It was a stretch there where SC won 12 out of 13 between 99 and 2011. But that 06 game where SC was a 22 and a half point favorite and UCLA shocked SC and denied SC the opportunity for a fourth consecutive uh, national championship game appearance. I, I remember being there live. And at the end of the third quarter, I remember the whole UCLA team coming together on center field and jumping up and down. And the SC you know, team saw that and they got to center field and started jumping up and down. I've never seen a scene quite like that. So this is just a really special game with a lot of special memories. And I really believe this year has the ability to be just as good, if not a greater game than <coughs> just a yeah, I, I was, I was I at that. I was at that 2006 game. That was not a that was not a happy day. <laughs> I was gonna say I saw Alfred shaking his head. We'll talk about the game. What, what made it not a good game on your end? Well, uh, I was there in uniform in 2006, freshman year. <laughs> but I mean, that was the game to go to the national championship, right? So that year was the to redeem the Vince Young year, and we already had a loss. We lost to Oregon State in Corvallis. We UCLA was not that good under Carl Durrell regime. We were supposed to walk right in, score 52, go play in the national championship and, and recover. But 
anything happens, right, on any Saturday. And at that time, that's when you could go into any stadium any week in the Pac-10 at that time. You played every single school in your conference and you could lose. And we went to the Rose Bowl and we're driving. Uh, J- J.D. C.C. Smith wide open. Those for the game winning touchdown. Bruce Davis gets his hands up tip. We play in the ro- – we- Four weeks later, we're back in the Rose Bowl. Number 16, we went from number one to number six. So that was not the greatest time, but it is what it is. The rivalry was great. Actually, two people I went to high school would play for UCLA. Three people from my assignment class played at USC. That's one of the greatest things about this rivalry. It's a true crosstown rivalry because you either play against somebody, play with somebody. That's one of the truest forms of rivalry that you get. It's family members on teams. It, it's it's actually great. Like, I will say this. Growing up, you knew the last game of the season, December, first Saturday of December, ABC at 12 o'clock, you know a game was going to come on. And that's the Trojans and the Bruins. Um, just to piggyback off, one of the greatest games I remember is uh, 2000. UCLA was supposed to just dog walk USC that year. They had Deshaun Foster. They had that great team that was just supposed to be on top of the world, and they walk in, and that was the turning point at that right then and there for the Trojans, where they walked in and they beat UCLA, and they had, and I tell you, UCLA was legit loaded. That was probably one of my favorite UCLA teams because at that time I was neutral, I was just an LA kid, and there was a really good team, and USC walked in and beat them. You, I mean, and like Jamal said, you just look through historically Sam Bam years where Sam Bam just runs through UCLA and he created jumping over the pile. You got. I mean, the great, like I said earlier, the greatest thing about this rival, at one point, kids weren't getting paid to leave the state, right? They were, you either went to USC or you went to UCLA. This is a hotbed full of talent. So these games were floated with talent, and it was just something special. These were two top ranked schools that first Saturday in December, and it was always special to watch. I'm hoping that they don't mess this up in four weeks, and at noon on ABC. It's the Trojans and the Bruins like it used to be. And hopefully it might be a 7, 8, 8, 9. It's going to be real close because schools are going to knock each other off. So that's the most exciting part about this. Absolutely. What what makes it so special is uh, no matter how bad or good these teams are, you really don't know what's going to happen in this victory bell game. Will, let's go over to you. What are some some memories or, or just game instances that you really have enjoyed watching over your time covering the Bruins? Well, I'll remember the first two games I watched within the rivalry, and they were both instant classics, if you will. The 2004 game with Reggie Bush, they won 29-24, to and it was the year Liner had won the Heisman Trophy, and it was going in to Bush. He was still an underclassman at this time, but 15 carries, 204 yards, two touchdowns, did the front flip into the end zone, and I think that kicked off his Heisman campaign rolling into the next season in a very strong fashion going, hey, They got liner, but this Bush kid might be even more special than the quarterback for the Trojans. And then 2006, I mean, you know, Coach Rowe talked about it. It was a game where USC had scored 20 or more points in 63 straight games. This is the peak of the Pete Carroll era. This is offense is flowing. UCLA comes out, and they hold them to nine points. It was a massive upset of big proportions because UCLA is unranked. SC is fighting to play in the national championship. You have to remember, this is the BCS at this moment in time. There's no college football playoff. If you finish the regular season at number two, you were playing for the title game. So for UCLA to pull off that upset, that was very, very massive. You know, obviously in just recent years too, being able to cover the team, the first time I actually met both of you guys in person was in the parking lot for the USC UCLA game last year. It was a classic game for UCLA fans as, you know, it was a 62-33 beatdown. But I will say this, is Chip Kelly still have his job at UCLA if he doesn't put the beatdown on USC last year? Because without that win, he's got seven wins on the year. So that just shows you how much of a game this is to the program. And, you know, Chip Kelly's had his struggles, but he's 2-2 two and two right now against the likes of USC. He's 500. The fan base is loving that. So those are the two games that really stood out to me, but – You know, doing my research, the one game that I thought was incredible that has not been brought up yet, 1992, and John Barnes, a fifth-string walk-on quarterback. It sounds like I'm making this up out of a Disney Channel movie. This guy was getting water for the rest of his players and, you know, holding bags for tackling drills. They have to put him in because they have no other option at the quarterback position, and John Barnes lights it up. 
with a 21 point fourth quarter rally, 385 yards and three touchdowns. The Barnes JJ Stokes connection that day lives long in the Bruin fans' memory. John Barnes, fifth string walk off Disney. If you need a script for a great idea, I think we got it right there. So all the UCLA USC game love, man. It's it's really really special stuff. Yeah, sounds like my my high school career minus all the the positive accolades at the end there, the the water <laughs> holding and the towel holding. I think I fit right in there. So Phil. Last off with you, what's what's some game memories or or rivalry memories or player matchups or or player performances that you can remember in this this great victory bell matchup? I mean, we we've just gone down the list of all all the who's who's. You brought up Deshaun Foster, we brought up the Reggie Bushes, Matt Liners, Troy Aikmans. Uh, I'm I'm relatively new to this particular rivalry, so I'll 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 keep it short. And as I'm looking towards the future. I think that where they're headed now is even better than where they have been. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, no, that's, sure. the, yeah. that's the best I, thing I about remember, it is that – go ahead, Jamal. Yeah, you know, I remember some of the games that even Will was talking about. You know, that I was on the field for that 4 game with Bush mm-hmm. and that 29-24 game. Liner almost lost the Heisman that night because he didn't throw for a touchdown pass. He had an interception – and those two runs, we were on uh, behind the goalpost and watching Reggie with those two 70-plus yard touchdown runs was the most spectacular thing I've ever seen. I was on the field for Fresno State, mm-hmm. and obviously that's the greatest he's looked in person. But my God, when you saw Reggie Bush in that 4 game, that was absolutely – that was transcendent. You knew you were watching one of the great players in the history of college football and – Will, I know you mentioned that John Barnes game. You know, the year after was Wayne Cook in the Coliseum, winner going to the Rose Bowl, and UCLA was able to break up a pass by by Rob Johnson, uh, Alfred, you know, at the end zone, picked it off in the end zone with five seconds to go to preserve that game to go to the Rose Bowl. And that's what's so sort of magical about this. In the 80s and the 90s, you had these teams where this game meant so much. The winner was headed to the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl was always on the line. You know, you had the Donahue years, and then right before you had the McKay years, and then John Robinson came back. And so we've had it where in the 90s, 91 to 98, UCLA won eight straight. And from 99 to 11, SC won 12 out of 13. And then in the 2010s, both teams are still trying to kind of find themselves with dominance. So the last 30 years, we haven't really had it where – each team was really top 10, top form going in. You know, we had that one oh five game with, with Bush and Leinart against Maurice Jones-Drew and Drew Olsen, where UCLA was number six, but they had just lost to, to Arizona, and that was just an iconic 5 USC team. That was 66 to 19, the final. It was <coughs> three at one point, 66 to six at one point. Um, UCLA had to get two garbage touchdowns at the end just to make it 66-19. So, this perfect collection, Ryan, of both teams being great, both teams being in the top 10, both teams with so much to play for and being evenly matched. I don't think we've had it since the early 80s or the 70s. And I think that's what makes November 19th so special. It's got all the ingredients. Yeah, Jamal, that's why in uh, Slack, when you were like, this is one of the greatest. So that's why I always mention the 80s, because I mean, yeah. I was born in 88, but like coming up, you always go back football history and you understand like, the winner of that game is going to the Rose Bowl, no doubt, right? So you understand how important that game was. And those games in the 80s were back and forth all the time. And, like, you knew, like, all right, whoever wins this game. like, And there was just great talent on the field. And like I said earlier, these were all kids from home. You know what I mean? It wasn't the national recruiting thing. These were legit kids from home. And you were legit watching guys and saying, all right, cool, that could be me one time. Like, you know what I mean? Like, even when you bring up, like, names like R.J. Sauer, Right, he played on an SC team that wasn't great, but he lit up the Rose Bowl in the Coliseum the whole time during this rivalry. Right, don't kick the RJ Sauer ever because you knew what was going to happen. Right, it's so many names and so many kids that happened that just go through, that went through this rivalry that <clears throat> that it's it's underrated nationally, but we know what goes on here. Right, like. If you look through the rest of the conference, the Territory Cup, it is what it is. The Apple Cup, it is what it is. The Civil War is starting to pick up a little steam because of Oregon, what they've been of late past 20 years. But the history of football, the battle for Victorville has always been there. 
right? And it's always meant something, and it was always talented. It always had high stakes that relied on it. And the fact that we're back to that, it's good for football. I always say the Pac-12 being good is good for football, and this is good for football. This game yeah. deserves to be back on TV on ABC at 12 noon, like it has been for the past 80 or something so years, right? A little exaggeration, but this game deserves to be back in the national prominence that it deserves to be in because we're going to have – we're going to have two top ten teams. We don't have it right now, wink, wink, but it is what it is. But <laughs> but it, it, we're going to have two top ten teams, and they deserve to be in primetime TV so the East Coast can see – how good we have become again. You know, Alfred, yeah. I'll say one thing, and then, Ryan, I'll, I'll give it back to you. I know we're hogging the tube a little bit, but I don't know if you guys believe in astrology or not, but there's something weird about every 17 years. Because if you look at 88, and then you look at 05, and now we're in 22, the last three instances of this game where both teams are in the top 10 and, and should be in the top 10, we expect that on November 19th. It's 17 years apart. Every 17 years, there's something about the universe and the stars aligning and the alignment of the planets that has USC and UCLA top 10 in football when they play each other. So I think it's going to be a magical game. Love it. I'm sure it'll be a beautiful evening. One thought, and then I got one question each for the two alum, and then let's go around the horn quickly and talk about where these teams sit right now in the rankings, and we can wrap up this first edition of Victory Bell Selection Show. Um, so first thought, I think the other special thing I'll add about this game that is is obvious to some extent, but maybe not totally, is just how much this game for some players means even more than national accolades, than overall record and i think to our two good buddies of ours you know one Corey pause great ucla quarterback had some great years at ucla some some top 10 finishes uh some big records during his playing days finished in the top performances for quarterbacks and his biggest regret is he never beat usc and you look at frosty rucker won two national titles played on the greatest usc teams we've ever seen and his greatest pride is he never lost to UCLA. So it shows that, that this game means so much to these players, and it kind of lost some of its luster, I think, among fans and among the city. But I think this is the year that it comes back because of where these programs are, where college football is in the confines of Los Angeles, what this network is trying to do for the city of Los Angeles when it comes to football coverage. And I think we're at the pinnacle of it, and, and I can't wait. And so before we get into the rankings, last two questions. Alfred, first year, then I'll go to Jamal. Alfred, you played in this game. You talked about 06, how bummer that was. But give us one quick, just great memory of this game, whether it was something on campus, just the vibe on campus during UCLA week, whether it was an actual play in the game. Just give us one great memory of being able to partake in this great matchup. I, I, I will say this. The greatest memory about this game, believe it or not, is that after the game, both schools actually come together and throw just monster parties. Same room, <laughs> everything. Like it, it, it's unbelievable how like this rivalry just completely happens for the whole week. They take the Trojan, they take the Bruin. It's beat the Bruins the whole week. It's beat the Trojans the whole week. You have this game four o'clock. You're showered, and they're like, "All right, this is where the party is." And you show up, and it's UCLA and USC, and it's everybody you went to high school with. It's legit. This is one thing I could say about this rivalry. This is legit. Cousin versus cousin, big brother versus little brother, like you said earlier. The greatest thing about this rivalry I can always remember is when it's over, we become family again because we're still California versus everybody else. <laughs> like that's what it really yeah. turns to. So like, <clears throat> like we understood what we went through, but we're back together and everything works out. I will say this, and I'll let you. This game right here will shut every critic up about the Rose Bowl attendance. I guarantee you, there'll be ninety thousand people there packed house loud as hell and everybody be like oh okay we apologize <laughs> yeah yeah oh 100 <laughs> i mean if anyone's looked at ticket prices i think that says enough so um jamal quickly and then we'll go around the horn again to wrap this thing up you mentioned about your yeah. your dad being just a diehard ucla fan and so i have to ask for those that don't i know but those that don't know you went to usc undergrad before you went to ucla postgrad how heartbroken was Papa Madney about his son going to hated USC? Oh, he was he was black and blue in the face and in the heart because uh, my four years at SC, uh, SC was forty eight and four, never lost a home game, and won four four and zero against UCLA. And outside of that twenty nine twenty four 
uh, 04 game, I mean, the other three games were absolute kind of 30 point beatdowns. And so it was, uh, it was tough for him to, to take that for sure. Uh, I have so many memories from this game, Ryan, but the one thing I think about the pageantry that I love being, having gone to both schools is how the fight songs incorporate the other. I mean, <laughs> USC could be playing Appalachian state, you know, on September 12th, week two, and, you know, the band at the end, you know, UCLA sucks, you know, is chanting that <laughs> from from week one. And then the famous UCLA fight, fight, fight. Well, during SC week, I can't say it, but it's, you, you know, UCLA FSC. So it's, uh, you know, the pageantry of the game is something else incorporating the other. But I completely agree with Alfred. It is very much of a brotherly type of rivalry because so many people have gone to both schools like me. So many people have parents and spouses and uh, brothers and sisters who have gone to the other school. And so that's just what makes it so unique and, and so special to the ethos of Los Angeles. Yeah, I love it. I uh, For those who don't know, I actually went to Long Beach State and we don't have football. So I know it sounds so weird to so many, but during college, we would go to both games. Just whatever the better matchup was, we'd either go to a USC game or go to a UCLA game. So I actually, my entire collegiate career kind of rooted for both just because I wanted both to be good because it meant so much more. Um, and I know that's hard for some people to fathom, but when you don't have a football team, you just want good football. <laughs> and And we have that now leading into November 19th. I know we're still a ways away. So Phil, I'll start with you. And we'll go then around the horn just to kind of wrap this thing up. We'll go, Alfred, with the college football playoff rankings since those came out on Tuesday. And currently you have SC ranked at ninth. You have UCLA ranked at 12th. So, Phil, give me your initial reaction to those rankings, how they came out. You can either bash some of their teams or you can just talk about how USC sits at nine and your thoughts on, on them and how they get higher up. And fuzzy. So if I got my cue, uh, I think those rankings were spot on. I think that the way they ranked USC ahead of UCLA was absolutely the right move. And uh, CFP finally got it right for once. I mean, you look at this passing attack and it's just bombs away and they're doing it with the backups now. I mean, Jerry's kid went out there and caught a touchdown. Taj Washington stepped up because he finally got an opportunity to do so. I mean, you look at you look at all the weapons that they put on the field. You, UCLA is nice. You, they're nice, but they're not USC. <laughs> Spoken like a, a SC fan. I love it. The jabs. These jabs are only going to get deeper and deeper as these series goes on and on. Will thoughts on UCLA being twelve? Not only behind SC, but behind some some other uh, choice SEC schools. Oh shoot! I think, it's, I think it's BS, man. If I'm being honest, I mean, you guys are ranked higher than us, despite us having a win over Utah, who's ranked in the top 15, compared to you guys who lost to them on a last second play. If you want to blame the officials, you guys can do that. I know that's what SC typically does with a loss, but it is what it is. You know, I got some <laughs> other issues too. I think. TCU is undefeated, but the next closest team in the Big 12 is at number 18 in Oklahoma State. For Oregon to be, you know, at number eight behind a TCU, their only loss being to the likes of Georgia, I I think that's, a, that's you know, a, a false call. And, you know, LSU, too, is the other team that I'm looking at when it comes to UCLA's case, you know, being a little bit higher. So I would put us a little bit higher than SC. I'd put us a little higher than the likes of LSU, a two-loss team compared to a one-loss team. But, you know, we'll have our chance November 19th to uh, take the victory bell and take the ranking and hopefully play for the Rose Bowl. Yeah, the LSU one is the the big one for me, and I, I spoke to Jamal earlier, and I'll just put this out there, and then we'll we'll toss it to to Coach and Jamal to finish up. But that's the the egregious one to me because what, what hurts is I, I truly believe the winner of the Pac-12 will get in as long as – chaos doesn't ensue and the winner is still a one loss team. I think they'll have shown enough. However, by putting LSU at 10 now when Alabama plays them and certainly will beat them probably by 25 plus, they get another top 10 victory on their resume that all of a sudden is going to look better for the, the committee. So that was extreme bias. In my opinion, I, I don't like it whatsoever. I think that's going to potentially, I don't think it will, I hope, but potentially will hurt either USC or USC down the line or USC or UCLA down the line when it comes to that selection committee, win one of these teams. Cause I truly believe one of these teams will win the PAC 12 titles. That's my thoughts on that. But Alfred, your thoughts on the rankings, where these two teams sit and how they correlate with the other teams ahead of them. 
So honestly, I think eight, nine, eight, nine, ten, and eleven should be all Pac-12 schools. Whatever order you want to put them in, you could put them in that order. But eight, time, eight, nine, ten, eleven should be all Pac-12 schools. So the everybody who's undefeated should be in the what is it? Five undefeated teams, five or six. They should be the top six. Put them whatever order you want to put them in. I don't care at this point. It doesn't matter. To me, I have a theory is don't rank the team until after the conference championship. Just let's let's leave all the rankings out of it. Let's play a season, then rank them after the conference championship, right? Let's see who's really good or who's really not, right? Because you're going to have Alabama, who's probably going to lose another game. You're going to have Tennessee or Georgia, who's going to lose a game. Michigan and Ohio State is going to lose a game. TCU has Texas and a, another game that's – who? Baylor. Baylor, right? That, that's, that's their toughest game. TCU might walk out of this thing undefeated. So how are you going to explain – and I know we're supposed to pretend to fit in our schools, but how do you explain an uh, undefeated TCU not making the Final Four, right? The Big 12. I mean yeah, – the, Yeah, the Big 12 ain't strong – ain't stronger than the Pac-12. Is it, it, I, I, hear what you, I hear what you're saying. But the whole point of the college football playoff is for everybody to get the same opportunity to be a national champion because the BCS was not able to do it. Now you're going to get a circumstance to where you're going to cause complete chaos and then your whole excuse is, well, next year we'll have 12 teams, so they'll make it next year, right? So that's all they're doing is protecting themselves for an excuse, but it's really bad. LSU lost to Florida State. UCLA is ranked lower than SC because they played Alabama State. USC has played all – uh, FBS teams. They didn't play one FCS team. So that's straight the schedule comes in. Notre Dame is starting to win. So that'll be a good, re- good one for, for USC on their resume. They play UCLA. They're going to beat UCLA. That'll be a good one, right? Oregon, Utah, that'll be a good one. So they have a chance to at least walk and get a New Year's Six. But them getting in, and I talked about it on our show, the Suits of Troy podcast, like I don't think they're ready to play a college football playoff game. But they're scratching the surface. But I still think that 9, 10, 11, 12, those four teams should be Pac-12 teams. Like, they're up and coming, and it's good for football. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no perfect science at this point. You only have four spots, and these are still humans making decisions. I just it, I just think it's so obvious, the, the SEC bias. But that we have we need a lot more show to really get into that. So, Jamal, <laughs> you can – you can wrap us up with UCLA 12, USC 9, where you like that, don't like that, and how they correlate with the other teams. Yeah, I'll start with just maybe kind of the national piece and then and then jump in law schools here. I think that, you know, if this is one of those scenarios where I think both USC, UCLA and Oregon are the are on the outside looking in uh, for the CFP. I think that in order for one of these three teams to credibly be in the CFP, I think both TCU and Clemson both have to lose a game in order for that to, to really take place, because at the end of the day, those are two teams that are power five teams. And if you have two power five teams that are undefeated, I get that maybe the big 12 doesn't have kind of that top end talent as, as maybe the PAC 12 does, but I have a really hard time believing the committee. I, I wouldn't do it if I were on the committee, let's say Oregon wins the PAC 12. You can't, you can't put a team that loses by seven touchdowns in, in, in a championship game, especially if that is one versus four and it's a potential rematch against Georgia. It's kind of like, well, we've already seen this, and they just got their doors blown off. I, I think that Oregon really killed themselves week one. If they could have just made it a more competitive game, but to lose 49-3 to and, and a team that can lose by 46 still has an opportunity to win a national championship, I think there's something fundamentally wrong there. So that's where I kind of deviate from the, the West Coast there is I think TCU, Clemson, and then the Ohio State-Michigan winner – and then one or two SEC teams are, are sort of in the driver's seat there for the playoff. And, and truthfully, I think both TCU and Clemson have to lose for one of these teams to get into the playoffs. So I think we're all kind of playing for the Rose Bowl. Now, I think having said that, I don't agree with UCLA being under uh, SC. I thought that UCLA would actually be higher than SC this first ranking. But I think here's an element that has gotten a little bit lost in translation. And it was Oregon State cracking the top 25. I think had a lot to do with SC uh, being above UCLA because Oregon State cracking the top 25. Now SC has a top 25 win. UCLA has a top 25 win. And SC's loss to Utah was so close. I think that factored it in. This week, Oregon State plays at Washington. 
And so I think that can potentially be a swing game where if Washington wins that game, now Washington's going to take Oregon State's top 25 spot. And now UCLA is going to have two top 25 wins and USC will have none. And so I think the ebb and flow next week, if Washington does win, I see UCLA jump USC next week in the rankings if that does take place. But I think, A, it's all going to kind of settle itself on the field because you have this game essentially being the Pac-12 semifinal and the winner most probably playing Oregon. The SEC is going to settle itself. Ohio State and Michigan are going to settle themselves. So I think it's fun to talk about right now, but I think ultimately both of these teams will be in the top 10 going into November 19th. And I'm so excited about that particular aspect. And I think for UCLA, I think they enjoy being the underdog. I think DTR plays better when he's got a big chip on his shoulder. I think Chip Kelly likes being under the radar. So I actually think it's a good thing going into November that UCLA is maybe a little bit undervalued. I think they struggled a little bit with the amount of exposure that they got that Oregon week. Um, and I think that they, they are more comfortable being in an underdog role. So I think it's all going to work itself out. They'll be uh, underdogs, but I think it'll be two top 10 teams on November 19th. And that's part of that ethos of the rivalry, Ryan. You know, when we say big brother, little brother, look, historically, USC is the big brother in this rivalry on football and UCLA is the big brother in this rivalry in basketball. So even this rivalry is so unique because big brother is different depending on what sport you're in as well. And so I think because we're talking about football right now, I think UCLA is very comfortable and they embrace kind of being the underdogs. So I think it's going to set themselves up very well for that November 19th game. Yeah, it's even different depending on what department your degree is you're getting in. Yeah. Uh, each school has different strength in uh, education. So it's going to be no fascinating. There's no strength in public education, Ryan. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to be fascinating. <laughs> we can't wait Number to low, get there. A Republican candidate for LAFB senator, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be like Hershey's. Don't be like Hershey's. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, well, this has been a blast. This is your first episode of the Victory Bell Selection Show. Coach Rowe, Phil Robinson, Will Decker, and Jamal Madney. I'm your host, Ryan Dyard. We can't wait to see it all shake out. We'll be here every week until the game, live at the Rose Bowl on November 19th. Thank you all for tuning in. Remember, LA Football Network, your source for everything you need for LA football. We'll talk to you guys all on the next episode. Bet online.